How can one define somebody like Milan? Not an easy task. A man of all seasons. A larger than life person. A charmer. A privileged mind. A renaissance man. These definitions can cover some aspects of his personality, but we still end up coming short. 101 years of a life well lived are just impossible to encompass with a term. This is precisely what Milan did. He lived his life well, with depth and with joy, with intelligence and heart. Milan, our dear friend, with his humor and wit and effortless charm with his kind demeanor and impeccable courtesy. With a gentle heart that had the utmost consideration and respect for others, that loved deeply and joyously always. Milan was and still is a very special presence in our lives and this tribute will offer us a chance to celebrate that. I was born in a small village 40 kilometers west of Zagreb, the capital. It was called Verbovets, V-R-B-O-V-E-C, on August 24, 1908, at midnight. My first important moment in life was when I met a very, very elegant man on a horse. I was going to the post office and because he was also going to the post office he picked me up and together we went and took the mail in and then he says I'm now taking you back to your home and I said well you should come to my home and you should marry my mother <laughs> the man was astounded at my proposal but when he arrived at the house and I introduced him to my mother he said lady I must tell you that your son says that I have to marry you. Believe it or not, my mother did marry him a year later. The next great event in my life, unfortunately, was not so lucky and so full of smiles. It was the end of World War I. The retreating German armies that went through our village. The house burned down, destroyed the sawmill. My whole childhood was erased, and that changed the life completely. I was raised in a village where we were important people. We ended up in a city. The city was Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. Zagreb would be Milan's home for the next seven years. While in high school, he won photo contest. And the prize was a camera, a real camera, because what I had was a box camera. The prize led to part-time work as a photographer at the local newspaper. The seeds were planted for his life's work as a journalist and a filmmaker. In 1926, Milan, who already spoke four languages, went through the baccalaureate. A grueling one-week exam mornings essays were written afternoon you met a commission that had the right to ask you any questions well I, I obviously passed the exam and that led to another very important event in my life i got a scholarship to the sorbonne in paris from the french government in 1928 milan left for paris as his train traveled across the continent, the French ranks collapsed. My scholarship suddenly became so small that I could barely pay for my rent. He took and passed an exam to be a, a tourist guide in Paris. The income was quite modest. Uh, tips and a little money bridged me over so that I wasn't hungry anymore. And I must say it was a very interesting time because I met a lot of people and uh, got to know a little bit about art. I went to France on a scholarship 
and studied there international law. I got my PhD. I also took a course and finally got a diploma in journalism. I had to go back to Yugoslavia to become not only a PhD in France, but also have the right to, to practice law in Yugoslavia. For the next couple of years, Milan served as a clerk to the Justice of the Supreme Court. That, that led to being named judge at a very early age, much too early, I would say. A very important event in my life. Three of us boys, same age, the three of us had discussed the fact there were students' camps on the Atlantic for, for, for Parisians or down at the Mediterranean, and nothing was done for the students of the University of Zagreb. We found an island and we started the first student camp in Yugoslavia. One of my first clients was the lady whom I married two years later. Milan Herzog married Vladimira Roni Pavlakovic in February of 1936. By 1937, Yugoslavia was moving towards a dictatorship. I knew that my life in the court would not be long, so I resigned before they could throw me out and got almost immediately hired by the second newspaper in Belgrade, the, the afternoon newspaper, that's why I call it the second. And uh, I became very soon head of the foreign policy department since I was the guy with the many languages. For the next few years, Milan interviewed many of the newsmakers of that turbulent period. He interviewed Lenny Riefenstahl, because he was the only journalist in Belgrade that spoke German. That was a great coup, and I must say it had influenced uh, the fact that I became among the searched and respected foreign correspondents. Since a boy, Milan had always dreamed about going to America. By 1939, the coming birth of their first child, Saja, and the growing turmoil in Europe convinced Ronnie it was time to leave. Milan, the journalist, wanted to stay and cover the events unfolding in Europe. But Milan, the father, came to realize that his family must come first. But one day, my wife called and said, I am packing already, and if you don't want to go, if your journalistic career is more important than your family, you stay here, I am going. Well. That was 11 o'clock in the morning, I know still down, on a Friday. On Sunday, we had liquidated our life completely, and we were on the train to Genoa in, in Italy, and there we boarded the only ship that was going to America, and that was the Conte di Savoia. That was the beginning of our new life. I was trying to get a job in New York, but it seemed to me impossible. There were literally thousands of refugees trying to get any job, a janitor or, or, or whatever. Milan found a job in Oakland, California, running a movie theater. When the theater was sold six months later, he moved to Los Angeles. And then I got a decent job. I became shipping clerk at Ditto Incorporated. And that was really the last job I had in California, because while I was working there, a telephone call came from Washington. I don't know how they found me, but they found me. And they offered me a job to come to Washington and help them with the problems they had with Yugoslavia. I met somebody at the State Department who said that Boston had a station that is desperately looking for someone who could broadcast uh, the news in Yugoslavia because the Yugoslavs had started the first opposition to the occupation of the Germans. In a few months, the group he was working with evolved into the U.S. Office of War Information, 
which later became the Voice of America. Milan was in charge of the Yugoslav section and also did two news broadcasts daily to the resistance movement in Yugoslavia. I did quite a lot of work, not only in radio, where I had my shows every day, but also in film. There came a time when the war ended. When I came to Washington to submit my resignation, my boss, William Benton, vice president of the University of Chicago, told me, I am resigning too. But wouldn't you go and work for my company, Encyclopedia Britannica? And <laughs> turned out that we liked each other instantly. Milan joined Encyclopedia Britannica in 1945 and worked there for 28 years without a written contract. I was making educational films as a producer and as a writer. Two years later, Milan moved with his company to Chicago. He bought his first house and his family, which now included his daughter Tanya, moved in on Thanksgiving Day, 1947. Although Chicago would be his home base for the next 23 years, he traveled all over the world writing and producing films. On August 18, 1965, Milan Herzog became the senior vice president in charge of production and international sales. In 1967, Milan's son, Saja Herzog, married Charlotte Rusty Kopak, and a year later, Milan became a grandfather with the birth of Nico Herzog. In 1970, Milan's daughter Tanya married Gary Foster. Later in 1970, Milan took charge of the West Coast office of Encyclopedia Britannica Films and made Hollywood his permanent home. Some films and series he has produced over the years are A Christmas Rhapsody, a contender for an Academy Award, Ballad of the West, Life in the Middle Ages, which was awarded the Prize of Paris. William, Lord of Montbreath, was a pious man. Je parle français, a French language series of 150 films. Well, I think, personally, I must have made about 500 films. In 1973, Milan retired from Encyclopedia Britannica and opened his own production company, Herzog Associates. In February, 1978, Milan's first wife, Ronnie, passed away after a prolonged illness. They were married for 42 years. In 1979, Milan married Shanta Yudwani. By 1982, Milan had four grandsons, Nico, Tori, Aaron, and Ryan. I also have a godson in Scotland with whom we keep close contact. After meeting each other at an international conference in 1975, Milan and Shanta spent many years organizing film festivals for children. I live in Hollywood and I produce a very large number of videos and one series was on child development and Shanta was a full partner in the production. To start with, I want to say that we are not Milan Herzog, we are Herzog Associates. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we do, we do together. I put this down on paper and I'm embarrassed now about looking at it. I wanted to welcome you all, because you make my heart beat faster, make my voice reflect the tears that I'm already holding back in the tradition of myself showing to be manly, macho, as one has to be here. <laughs> I am but an old river just flowing along, but next to me there is a spring of water that feeds the river along just like in the song, Old Man Milan. <laughs> he will say something. He wants to say something. <laughs> How he is so smoothly just rolling along, supported by Shanta, inspired by Shanta, 
old man Milan. <laughs> Just rolling along. He don't count the numbers. He don't count the birthdays. He's just rolling along. Every morning, every day, admiring nature, admiring creatures. He swims, he walks, he loves, he talks. Yes, that's old man Milan. Just rolling along. <laughs> such fives on them. May I look back at the real donor? You can be heard. I cannot be heard. <laughs> you know, it's the first time in my life people don't tell me show like oh. <laughs> A poem today by our Nobel Laureate. The Noble Man, sir. I will try and I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Come, oh come, my faithful muse. Today is the day you I can use. It is the day when Kate and Will want to hear the bar. It's the day singing to them the old of a loving heart. It's easy to say, but not so easy to play, because we all are human. How can you? Thank you. 